think we're ready to go, everybody. Mic's on. All right, IT, we're ready to go. I take it it's 6.30, so let's wake this up. All right, welcome, everybody. Appreciate you being here and those who are going to be online. We're going to uh, call this meeting to order. So this is a regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners, September 13th, 2022. So at this time, uh, I'd like to know if there's any requested changes to the agenda. None heard. And then can I have a motion to approve the agenda as? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as published. Good. Thank you very much. I wasn't going to give it all to you. All right, the agenda motion is up. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. How about that? All right, so if you please uh, join me and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and then remain standing for a brief moment of silence for us. seated. All right, I understand there is uh, there are no general public comments tonight, so we'll move down to the consent agenda. Can I have a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda? So moved. All in favor? Aye. All right, unanimous. Go around. We're going to jump down to recognitions real quick. So I understand uh, one of you guys, uh, who's up? I didn't see any familiar faces. Okay. Magic window. My apologies. Should have my microphone on. But uh, if IT sh could uh, pull up that PowerPoint slide and we can give Miss Long that uh, recognition, that would be great. There she is, there with the chief. And uh, we really appreciate everything she does here uh, doing the admin assistant, administrative assistant duties for the police department. Uh, always a pleasure to uh, come in and have her greet you at the door there. She's always there. Seems like she doesn't ever leave that spot during the day. And so we just would really want to let her know how much we appreciate her and her time here with the town. That's great. She does a great job at that. And she sings really well too, as some of us know that she's subbed in a couple of times in a pinch. So it's really, uh, really surprising. I did not know that. Well, that's very interesting. Huh? Pretty cool. Okay. All right. Huh. Thank you. All right, we'll move down to presentations. Orion, I think you're up. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Um, my name is Orion Holtai. I'm um, design services engineer for Town of Waxa. Um, here I'm presenting um, Open Fiber Technologies. This will be expanding their fiber services throughout the town of Waxa. Um, they're currently it's expanding into Union County, and they're located in Mooresville, North Carolina. Fiber One is actually their installer, and we'll be doing the installations. They're doing installations currently in Weddington and Indian Trail right now, if you're curious of how things are going, um, and they're ready to get going to work. Uh, we have two gentlemen from Open Fiber here tonight. One of them is Mark Wodasek and Dimitri Mosa. Have any questions that are available to answer the questions? Right. Welcome. Any questions from the board on this, Commissioner Hall? Hey Ryan, uh, thank you. Uh, I did have a question with respect to I think it's slide number five, where it uh, outlines the installation areas, and some of the questions I've asked previously is what are the future plans for south, just south of town, because that is an area that is uh, that would really benefit highly from um, uh, from higher speed internet connections. Great, thanks. Thanks for having us. Um, uh, do you perhaps have that slide available with the coverage? I'm not quite yes, sure that we Oh, there we go. Somebody's done something. 
Yeah, back, back one more. There you go. Nope. Doesn't want to stay. <clears throat> so if you can describe those areas there, that looks like the areas in red are your first phases. Yeah, it's 75 running east to west there, about three quarters of the way down. That would be correct. Below 75 there is what he's asking. Well, the, yeah, the areas that, that are highlighted in the lighter green, which is within the town limits, um, his, historically under serviced for internet connectivity. algorithm in our system that has X amount of frontage because we're a privately funded organization and we don't benefit from any um, grants from the United States. They, there could be funds that are already allocated for those previously um, underserved areas um, and we could certainly have a look into that for you. Um, happy to make that an agenda point and come back to you with more detail. Yeah, I think that'd be helpful especially for you know as, as commissioners so that we can communicate to that community yes. and let them know what you know future phases um, might be planned for them. So what makes those underserviced areas um, more feasible than non-underserved areas is that typically we could maybe use existing infrastructure and run the, the technology from an aerial perspective. Generally, we only do our infrastructure underground um, and we're trying to future-proof, you know, when storms and hurricanes and whatever come through. So I, I don't think that it would be an impossibility, but it would certainly have to look into it. Okay. How do we follow up on that? Ryan? I can get whoever wants feedback, maybe you, sir, on, um, or if you want to go through the town engineer or however you want to process that information. I think the best person would be to go through our assistant town uh, manager, town engineer, Mr. Matt Hubert, and uh, as well as Orion. All right. We'll set, we'll set up formal communication. We'll, we'll keep a certain specific channel going on all the information for that. Yes, and then we can relay the results to the board. Any other questions? Commissioner Mori. Jeff, have we reached out to Indian Trail and uh, talked with them, see how their project's going along? Yes. I mean, there's the, uh, the ample things are fine, but then there's also, you know, issues as far as just, you know, following up customer service, things like that. When, uh, when you have um, a large project like that where yards get torn up, there are issues and I think it's definitely uh, pertinent to have them mindful of that and to be uh, you know, as best as you can provide good customer service to our citizens that uh, some of them can get quite upset when you're tearing up parts of their yard and we just really respectfully ask you to be very very mindful of that uh, they said Indian Trail that they were uh, pretty well responsive, <clears throat> but you know not everybody's happy all the time with those type of things, which is what you would expect. Okay, so I'd, I'd like to hear from from them if, if we could about what they plan on doing to follow up and, and inspire a little more confidence in. Sure. So um, what what we have is we have an office in Matthews, and Matthews is our um, regional office to service. Matthews in the Union County area. It service, it'll service about 75 to 100,000 homes. And our policy and thought process around that is that you have a physical retail shop front office that you could physically go and walk into if you wanted to. Um, we have um, a lot of individuals that answer the phone, so we're not a corporate head office um, where you would typically stay on hold if you have a complaint. We're currently averaging about 1.2% um, complaints versus amount of homes that we're passing from a, a network perspective. So we like to, we've generally seen globally from a trend perspective that if you keep it below 2.5% you're doing well. So we like to try and keep it below 1%. Unfortunately, Union County is an extremely rocky um, environment. So um, a lot of the complaints, I'll be honest with you, are the technology is where we drill underneath people's driveways. Sometimes when that drill head hits a hard rock, it comes up 
and um, it damages the driveway, we then go and replace the entire portion of the driveway from a concrete perspective. No cost to, to the homeowner. Obviously, you can understand people come home and they see this, they are furious, right? So, and a lot of people, they jump on the phone. We've had complaints to Indian Trail. We've dealt with Adrian and Todd at Indian Trail. We sit, we put plans together, uh, resolution plans. They're happy with it. Um, we give dates when we're going to repair um, things. We have a fault tracking um, system. We try and stick to a four-hour SLA where we, respond, where we respond to people. Um, we have all the adequate insurance and, and everything in place. And it is not our intention to, and this is what we've told every town that we've been to, it's not our intention to have unhappy people because ultimately the brand needs to sell itself, right? And if you don't get it right through the installation process, nobody's going to sign up for your service. So that's really our approach, right? Just try and be as in touch with the human factor as we possibly can. Yeah, and, and I'll touch on uh, a couple items too. So from a marketing perspective too, we definitely want to work with you from a social media aspect, press release aspect as well. I believe um, I've already been in contact with Linda as far as wording and stuff goes. But additionally, uh, before we start construction in these areas, we're meeting with HOAs and, um, and, and trying to basically let them know what our process is, what, what's going to take place. And then additionally, two weeks before construction begins, we do put door hangers on every door uh, to let people know, hey, listen, this is, this is us, this is what's happening on the back. Uh, they're able to scan the QR code, follow us, make sure that we have a direct line of communication with them. Additionally, to a lot of large neighborhoods, we'll set basically a sign out front to let them know, hey, this is the communication, reach out to us, here's our number, here's our contact information. Would you mind leaving us one of those door hangers? Sure. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Any other questions? Dan. Good. Good evening. Question that I have. So fiber will basically be another option or consumer option for like internet or streaming TV? That's correct. And is that going to be through your company or will those fiber be leased through a third party? Uh, it will be through our company. We, we're a closed access um, organization and what that means is we build, maintain and operate our own network. Uh, but the technology is being put in the ground from a future proof perspective where when I want to say legislation is going to change and we, we do see it happening in the next 15 to 25 years in America that all networks will get a benefit from the government if they go open access which means exactly what you're saying right other service providers have the opportunity to come and offer their service on top of your platform so it is built that way future proof but right now no and so how soon after installation could a consumer purchase a package or give that other tomorrow. or yeah. what are you looking to like so, if you so, come so and do my street and I want fiber how how long do I have to wait before I can right yeah. so, so there's, there's a lot of different variables that go into it however let's say we start construction and it's a neighborhood of let's just call it 500 different homes um, we could be done with construction within a month, month and a half. We can then have that service live probably a month after that. So it's a, it's a very quick turnaround. And, and sorry, just to capitalize on that, what we've done is we need to position a cabinet in the right of way. And, and we've identified one or two um, positions which we will obviously send the drawings through for, for permission, permission and approval. And we build our network out from that. And the equipment physically sits in that cabinet. So we don't typically build on the edge of the network where it's going to be. And then people have the expectation of, oh, well, they built it last month. When am I getting a service? And we try and build out from the equipment. We submit the permits based on that. I mean, this is a unique scenario, but we will be building out from the equipment. Very good. Got it. Anybody else? Good. All right. And, and there, there's just one thing I did want to add. So, sure. so what our infrastructure is doing and providing is we're actually providing gigabit services to the home. So what that means is it's, it's future-proof from a technology perspective as everything's evolving from you know, online schooling um, to a lot of you know, folks working from home now. Um, and then it just gives them that better Internet, uh, more reliable Internet option from a speed perspective as well say just even for smart homes like everyone has so many devices that are operated in their homes from their like 
ring cameras, nests, and everything. Everything uses. People don't realize it, but there's more than lot. 20 in every home. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's much. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Box. <laughs> you have six. We'll manage. All right. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate that. Ryan, you good? All right. I'm next, so. All right. All right. So I'll, I'll I'll let us get to you. So no public hearings tonight. No old business tonight. New business. Orion, you're up again. Yes. So we're here tonight to uh, consider the approval of the award of the contract for the Sunbonnet Lane uh, improvements. Um, the lane was programmed for the fiscal year 22 capital improvement plan, and the the and received six bids. Uh, Carolina Cajun Concrete was the lowest responsible bidder at $197,230. Um, tonight I'm recommending actions, a motion to award Sunbonnet Lane Capital Improvement Project to the Carolina Cajun Concrete, Inc. and authorize the town manager to ed execute the contract in the amount of $197,230. Um, second motion is to transfer $97,230 from the American Rescue Plan Fund Reserve Contingency to the Small Transportation Project Fund to complete Sunbonnet Lane Capital Improvement Project. Very good. We've all looked at this before. Questions, Commissioner Hall? Um, so uh, my only question was, there, have, these, have these bids been locked in? Because I, I, what we'll see later tonight is, you know, there's some overruns and such with construction efforts, so. Um, I mean, these came in about a month ago, right? Right. So no, yeah, this is their, this is their bid, and it's locked in. Yeah. The only question that was done during the bid was asking if fuel prices would change, or the not fuels, the asphalt price. But since it's such a small amount of asphalt, it's 650 feet of asphalt, which is, I mean, it would, seems like a lot, but it's not for an asphalt project. So the price change would be like two thousand dollars if gas changed five, you know, five ten percent. So it's not. A, okay, that's good. Wasn't a concern. Yeah, that was my question. Okay, very good. Anybody else? Questions around? All right, so we are looking at two things here, two motions tonight. So I uh, guess we'll take a look at the first one. Who wants to make a motion? Charlie, does it matter which one comes first, the uh, transfer of the 97000 or? I guess transfer. Technically, it doesn't really matter, but you probably would want to do the contract first. All right, then I make a motion to award the Sunbonnet Lane Capital Improvement Project to Carolina Cajun Concrete Incorporated and authorize the town manager to execute the contract in the amount of $197,230. All right, very good. Motion's up to award the contract. All in favor? Aye. All the way around, unanimous. Okay, next one. Uh, I'd like to make a second motion to transfer $97,230 from the American Rescue Plan Fund Reserve Contingency to the Small Transportation Project Fund to complete Sunbonnet Lane Capital Improvement Project. All right, very good. The motion's up for the STP transfer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All the way around. All right, we're good. Everybody just make a comment. I'm just very happy that we're finally able to move forward with that, that project. That's a great project that's been a long time coming and a long time deserving, even though it was very challenging on the administrative side. It was. How how long has that neighbor been in existence? Thirty years. I would know better. <laughs> Thirty like years. That. Thirty years at least somewhere. That's a long time to wait. So, uh, good work, all of you. Can't wait to see it down because I go by there often and you know we see the sign all the time and I think, oh, when's it going to happen? So I bet they're going to be happy. You can ask the question. How long will it take to be completed? Um, Sure. Well, 45 spoke with the contractor today. He's going to try to get the survey crew out there this next week. We'll have our construction, pre-construction meeting uh, later this week or early next week. So hopefully construction starts in the next two to three weeks and 45 days he estimates it'll take. Hopefully by Thanksgiving. Great. 
providing the weather holds, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have the consideration of approval request for modification of the facade improvement grant. We've got Miss Janet up to talk to us. Welcome. Hi. Uh, I am Janet Pirano. I'm a planner and the HPC liaison for the town of Waxhaw. Um, tonight, I am here to discuss a modification to a facade improvement grant that was approved back in May. So the project was at uh, 108 East South Main Street, and it was originally approved uh, back in May, and the renovations included replacing all of the windows and the door, uh, removing the shutters, and painting the trim on the front and the rear of the building. Um, as the work progressed and the old windows were removed, um, there were additional issues revealed. Uh, and the project was delayed and ran into some cost overruns. So Mr. Johnson is requesting additional funding to assist with the cost of those unforeseen repairs. The original cost estimate was $29,536. The project actually cost $38,355.80, so there was an overrun of $8,819.80. The facade program provides up to 50% of the cost of rehabilitation, and the grant that was approved was approved to not exceed $14,768. Our grant guidelines do allow for modification of a grant uh, that requires BOC approval, uh, and the request is to provide an additional $4,409.50, which is 50% of the cost overrun. So tonight we're looking for a motion to approve the modification uh, to that grant award for the additional funding. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And Mr. Johnson is also here if you have any questions that he needs to address. All right. Welcome, Mr. Johnson, for one. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Town manager has a question real quick. Well, just one, one quick thing to uh, point out, Mayor, is that uh, Mr. Johnson's facade grant was approved back in the previous budget year so his reimbursement for that initial work was back in the previous budget year's budget so so far this year we have not expended any funds in the facade grant okay so will the, this will then go to this year's allocation then is that what i'm hearing that's correct we are officially closing Close the, the books. books um as of shortly there's, there's, yeah. right. Is there money left in that budget for the facade grants? To, last year. From last year? There was some, yes. And we were not able to transfer that over to this year? We thought it was best just to keep that in this fiscal year when this request was coming through instead of dating that back to the previous year's budget. And so far, we have not in any year we've been doing this we have not gotten to the be well when Max it was 25,000 but now the 50,000 we have not reached that uh, limit yet with any requests roll it forward meaning he's asking to roll forward the leftover from last year into the new year and I see Rosie Ask, you know, can I answer that question? Yes. No, no, come up to the microphone so the audience can hear you. Okay. So we are, right now, we have closed any processes for um, making any further amendments except for the budget amendment I'm requesting tonight on the last fiscal year. Um, we are in the process of completing everything so we need to have our audit done and the budget once we shut off that budget it cannot roll forward the excess funds don't roll so, so basically we completed all of our administrative stuff and this evening was books. that final step to get us ready for all right nothing left hung over from last year just right. closing the books so um, we extended payments for the last fiscal year through the month of August 
So we really needed to close it down and make a specific cutoff date so that we had ample time to get everything collected and processed for the auditor, which the, the, you know, the financial audit is due at the end of October, and he'll be coming to see us in just a few weeks. It's not like the money disappeared or went somewhere else. It just closed out one and added. You don't right. really add it to another, but it's just done. It's just that, that year is done. Whatever's left over in the budget the, the um, rolls into the fund balance. Right. So that's we don't lose the We money. didn't lose it. We just didn't spend it. Right. right. So this amount of money would be deducted from the 50000 that for this current fiscal year. Yeah. Right. be correct. And but he doesn't, there's no, like, applying again or anything like that. It's just so that was my question also. Yeah, exactly. How, how is that going to, how are we going to reconcile this? If you wanted to come back. Well, if he wanted to come back with a new project, he would make a new application. Well, I think what he's asking is how do we apply the $4,000 to this year? It's What's the administrative? Yeah. Right. Oh, well, that's just accounting. We can we can do that. I don't think that's, I mean. There's no, I don't see any yes. real need to go through the process again right. for an I, overage. Yes, that's. You might as well keep standing up there, Rosie, so. <laughs> um, so we just, well, what will happen is once this is approved, we do, we'll just process that out of the current fiscal year, out of the current budget line, and it will just reduce the $50,000 that's allocated for fiscal year 23 with that and then we'll just use the balance in that account for whatever comes through during the fiscal year. But I think what I'm not hearing the answer to yet is that do we have the ability, even though we're closing out the books, does that contract, that agreement with the party roll over? They're looking for how do you account for the four thousand dollars? That's what I'm hearing. Is that what against I'm hearing? Against right? the application that occurred last year. Because we, right. we want to be able to track the, an overrun. We, we, have an, we have an invoice, correct. We have the paperwork that Mr. Johnson submitted for reimbursement that shows that he paid the $38,000. Guess what they're looking for. Do we have to start a new process or not for, for the overage? That's what I'm hearing? No, we won't need a new process. We'll only need a purchase order. We should probably figure that out in some of our administrative language when we do that going forward. Because this is going to happen again. We should all be prepared for it. when we start tearing apart our old buildings. You're going to run into stuff. And it's going to change things. So, all right. Well, yeah, this particular that. one went over our, our um, accounting year. It so went over our accounting year. That's right. correct. So we just want to be sure that when we look this up in the future, we can see, okay, this application number actually went over by um, whatever. $8, the amount. $8, it was eight and he gets the half. Yeah. It sounds like part of this questioning goes back down in the audit so how do you how does if it comes out of the next fiscal year how do you reconcile it with the previous fiscal year because the That's original right. application was in 2020 22 each facade grant is assigned a number in our system right. so there will be a paper trail that goes with that facade grant number right. and then all of that paperwork goes to accounting and then that's correct you would ask the auditor how you would I mean, it sounds like the question is more of an auditing type question. How do you, if you close thing on one, how do you allocate the next fiscal year toward? But I also think if we allocate 50,000, we're taking the 4,000 out of this year's budget. I'm sure if something came up that exceeded what we had left in that fund, we could move something from fund balance to make up for that. Absolutely. Because, because the, the extra money that we didn't spend this year in the facade grant program goes into the fund balance. So we could. It's just what bucket it's in. It would be in there for us to be able to utilize for this if we had another project that would exceed what's in that bucket. That's correct, and, and as I've said on several occasions, we haven't had the, I guess you would say, good problem of people exhausting that budget as of yet. So, but we do going get And it's been a, a few years. Yeah. But, I mean, we have going... You know, next on the agenda, um, possibly changing eligibility. And so moving forward, if we have, if we end up giving the 50000 to different applicants, and then each of these applicants has change orders where they're 
their costs increase, we can't keep paying for that overage for them. When we're giving away the 50000 that that's it, you know? So I think that we at least need to think about moving forward. Uh, I don't know if we want to adjust the policy or something, but I mean, what would we do if we've given this 50000 and then somebody comes back and says they have an overage and we don't have that money anymore? It's, you know, it's already been used, so. Well, you would have the choice then as, as you would uh, if you, we had new applicants. You could make the choice to award for that cost increase and then you would take it from probably fund balance. You know, some other line I item. think that actually speaks exactly to what uh, Commissioner Moray was saying is that perhaps the overrun should should be just a new application. Well, thank to Janet's point. Yeah, the application has a number on it. Yes, yeah. it's it's not like it dies. Right. I don't really see there being an accounting issue with it crossing. We have a lot of projects that cross over year to year. So, I don't. That's correct. And what we will do is we just put the contract from in both fiscal years because we put it. We'll put a copy of it with the payment so that we have a trail to see why we paid some in the last year and why we're paying some in this year, and it will show the total. I mean, we can combine it together, but we'll have it in you know two separate years. And I think, that, again, to Jeff's point, I mean, we have projects that flip over year to year. We can trail those without brand new contracts and brand new agreements. It will. It shouldn't come out of fund balance every time this happens. It would only come out of fund balance if we ran the entire uh, allocated amount. And then once that allocation is extinguished, that ends. And so if by chance that an applicant comes and we've exhausted the funds in that, then that's the end of it. Then they'd have to come to apply to us to make a, uh, uh, a request to up it. But that's if, the, if we exhausted the fund. That's what I'm referring to. No. We actually have by the end of the last year's... Somewhat. So what I would suggest is that Janet and your crew, you work out some language uh, going forward on how we do this, because we will run into it. There'll be more and more people applying. Is that going to work with the... Uh, I think mass? that's fine. I mean, we, we get inquiries you know, quite regularly, but... Uh, very few, at least recently, applications. But you know, we hope that that will will change. I mean, at this point right now, we're in the middle of something, so I'm not sure if the appropriate response would be make somebody go through the whole process again. That's what we're trying I think to it's avoid. Kind of a, I think it's kind of a inconsiderate, you know, decision for us to make that way, and we'll have to come up with language on what happens again when we run into this. This is, again, new territory for us. We've, it's been so long that we've exhausted that, and, and I bet we probably never crossed the fiscal year while we exhausted it before, but don't know that. Not a first in time. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, we certainly want to encourage more improvement sure. Absolutely. to our area, so I don't want to discourage the program and make it insane, but that would be my thoughts. So has this work already been done? It's, yes. Okay, so there's no more delay you don't expect anymore Build, okay. buildings completed we, okay. we've done all renovations and Great. actually we're planning to start more renovation on the other building the old new price building Great. so we're going to be applying for another grant on the okay okay so you don't you don't uh, see any further delays or anything of that nature what's that no you don't see any further delays it's already okay. yeah, the mono building is complete so. 
Yeah, it looks really good, by the way. It mm -hmm. really does look good. And actually, I, you know, you walk by that at night. It's actually very intriguing to be able to look inside the glass and see what's inside there. It's, uh, it's pretty unique. So you see people up in the cigar bar up there, and you see all that activity where you really didn't see it before because they had shutters and all this other stuff. So I think it's pretty cool. Anyway, that's my comment. But any other thoughts, comments? All right, seeing none, I'm looking for a motion. Make a motion to approve a modification to FIP-13694-2022 toward additional funding in the amount of $4,409. Very good. And 90 cents. And 90 cents. <laughs> <laughs> Details, right? Details. Uh, all right, so motion's up. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, very good. Thank you. And thank you for being patient with us through that. Thank you, and thank you for stepping in for a little education session. All right. All right, we'll move on. Next up, Janet, you're up again. Yes, I am. Okay. So my next request is for modifications to the Wax Off Facade Improvement Grant Program guidelines. So the facade grant program was established in 2010 um, to assist property owners as they invest in historically appropriate rehabilitation projects that will serve to increase the viability of downtown Waxhaw and to spur interest and investment in the downtown and thereby benefit the greater community. So the first modification is a change in the period of eligibility. The program was originally established to provide funding for facade work on structures that were built between 1888 and 1941. And the time period was chosen uh, because Waxhaw was established in 1888 and 1941 is 50 years prior to the date that our survey was done to establish our National Historic District. So that's the 50 year rule. Um, and that's what we had gone with when we established the facade grant program. We've never revised those dates as the years has, have gone by. So from 2010, or when the program was established, we, we haven't made any changes to that. We'd like to change the guidelines to read for structures built 50 or more years ago uh, to keep the up to date without having to come back to the BOC every year to change a set date um, and doing that will allow more properties to become eligible and will contribute to the economic vitality through historic preservation that you heard our downtown director speak about last at our last meeting um, so some of the things that spurred this change was a mailing that we sent out to advertise the facade grant program um, and we had gotten several inquiries that from people who weren't eligible because their buildings were built after 1941. And some of the examples are there on that screen. Um, there's the Fox Pizza building, which was built in 1952, the Tangles building from 1960, and the Greco Fresh building, which was built in 1968. So we've had inquiries from all of those and some residents uh, who just were not eligible because of the 1941 end date. We discussed the period of eligibility change at the last Historic Preservation Commission meeting, and the HPC is in support of that change. So the other changes um, have to do with administrative approval for minor modifications to the scope of work and for additional funding of up to 50% of the original award, um, and then anything over 50% would need to be approved by the BOC. Um, renovations to historic structures often reveal unforeseen damage uh, that were not included in the original scope of work or in the original cost estimates. And you know, we heard from Mr. Johnson tonight about the overruns on his project. Um, and we've had those comments from previous grant recipients. Uh, so allowing administrative approval of these issues would be provide better customer service and allow these projects to stay on schedule. So what I'm requesting tonight is a motion to approve the modifications you know, as they have been presented, and I would be happy to answer any questions. 
Very good. We've talked about this before. You guys are racing to the microphone today. So, Commissioner Hall, we'll go with you. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the, the only question I, I had was that, so these updates um, to the uh, historical uh, preservation uh, period of historical importance changes from 1888 to 1941 to 50 years or more ago would open up structures up to 1972, is that? Correct, yes. Okay. And is the, is the um, spirit of this to try and capture the other inquiries that have come in in that period? Yes, yes, and, and the original intent was to provide assistance to people downtown. Um, so by allowing that longer period of time, we can help more people and bring more refreshment to the downtown. For structures up to, as of today, Anything up to 1972. The, yes. And then that will just roll as you know, time goes by. And only within the, back. the downtown district, right? Within the facade grant area. Okay. All right. Good. Questions? Thoughts? Ask again? Yeah, I just kind of curious about the, um, so also the increases up to 50% of the grant amount. Have we thought about what the potential financial impact to the town is on? We have, have not exceeded the amount that we've allocated in years. Um, it used to be $25,000, and that was the one time, and I, I think it might have been the Nibbins project that was a large project that ate up that money. Um, last year, we probably had about $20,000 left in the fund. Um, so by expanding it and allowing for the 50% um, overruns, just makes it easier for those who, who want to apply. We're moving things forward, you know, again, we're, we're giving us some freedom to include buildings as they age out, mm -hmm. one. If we did, again, to the last conversation, if we had a situation where we used up the 50,000, but we had, say, 10 more applicants that want to do that. You either put them into the next year or we as a board can decide if we want to increase the amount for that allocation. Would that be correct? And I, Yes, that is correct. And, and I'll say too that you know, we, we want people to utilize these funds and we want people to, to, we want it to be as easy as possible within the scope of things. And uh, I certainly have sympathy and empathy for folks that, that have cost increases because we experience that on a almost hourly basis here it seems like now with the town and everything that uh, that we're doing and all the projects that we are experiencing right now so I I personally think that it's good to try to make this process as easy on the applicants as we can and that encourages hopefully more people to apply and it goes back to what I've said before is that we have the good problem of maybe having to figure out additional funding an upcoming budget year to try to have more uh, people coming in to utilize those funds. And part of the design of this language in here now is to give our people the latitude here so we don't have to keep going. You know, we, we are, we are in, you know, experiencing increases, labor materials, all that kind of stuff. We don't want to he keep coming back to the drawing table for something we already approved to do. And that's correct. And that's having to extend the process out that way I, I think is unnecessary. Commissioner Simpson. So I just want to understand because the thing that I'm looking at is the additional funding up to 50% of the original award and just sort of that language two things and so if I understand what this is written is that if it goes up to the 50% more that would be administratively approved so they would like in the example of tonight uh, Mr. Johnson wouldn't have had to have come back before us for a modification that would have been done in-house administratively. Is that correct? It's correct, as long as it had stayed within that percentage. Okay. And then the other piece of that is, if there was a cost overrun greater than, or like 50% or more, I mean, that could be a very significant amount. How do we plan for, I mean, right now we don't have, we're not using all that money, but 
like you said, if we had an issue, how do we plan for that if all of a sudden everyone's having these big cost overruns and we're hitting that ceiling? You would do it in your, in your annual budgeting process. You would see what was being spent. You know, we keep up with our expenditures uh, every week, every month. You see how you're doing, and then if you anticipate that you need more in your upcoming budget, then you allocate for that and you continue to do that moving forward. It would be just like anything else, uh, uh, utility bills. I, I guess the point is, like, if we have 50000 and we allocated that all 50000 to, like, three or four different entities doing a project, then all of a sudden they all have these costs overruns, which could be pretty significant. And I, and I know we could probably take it out of the fund balance, but I just, for planning-wise, I mean, is, do we, will we have a contingency or something? I think this next budget year we would account for that, absolutely. I mean, I I think we'll be fine this budget year, I really do. I don't think we're going to have uh, any issues of going over that budget. If we find that we get more uh, grants and we have to consider that, then we will, and we can always do a budget adjustment. Um, when we get closer to the end of the year and we see that uh, end of the budget year and there's uh, a line item or another department that has a lot of money sitting there that's not being utilized you can move that over into the planning department to make up any any uh, thing in that budget item that you would need to do well I hope that, I hope that we get more people applying it's just yes. I want to make sure we can we have the the, the money to, to do it and, and if they do have big cost overruns that you know there's enough to facilitate all that yeah Right. It goes back to the previous conversations. If we exhaust that fund, then we decide, you guys decide on what you're going to fill up the bank account with again, and with the bucket, you know, they'll come out of the fund balance, whether they come out of some other grant, whatever. Again, the money, the we'll call it this year, 50000 is 50000 If that runs out and there's more applications to come in and we want that work to be done, then we decide. I would really like to have that problem. I'm <laughs> serious. I really would. That would be a good thing. We've and I'd like people to utilize it. And I'd like to think that I'm sure that you would keep us up to date with your reporting, how that fund is, if we get close to exhausting it. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, I think it all comes down to a matter of good communication. As we see facade grant requests come in, even if we don't get the application right away, we know something's coming, communicating with Jeff so we can pass it along to you all and communicating with Rosie so that accounting knows what's happening. Yeah, I mean, I really see it like any other budgeted line item. You keep up with how the expenditures are going, and then you adjust if you have to in that budget year. And of course, you see how it's moving along, and then you account for that in your next budget. Okay, well, you know, we're looking like we're going to spend this, and we need to make that increase in the next budget to account for it moving forward. Or if we approach that, I'm sure you would come back to us and say, hey, we're, we're reaching our ceiling. Do you want to reconsider this? Or, yeah. you know, we'd bring it back as an item for us. Any others? Commissioner Hall? I'm going to make a motion to table this to the next meeting on September 27th. Okay. Any discussion? Okay, so motion is up to table it. I'd like to uh, make a motion to table this discussion until uh, September 27th. It's the next meeting? It's the 27th. 27th. All right. All right. If that's uh, any other discussion on it, on the matter? All right. Motion's up. I have a discussion. I just, is there, is there just sort of the rationale, the reason why? Yeah, I have some additional questions that I'd like to flush out. Okay. I, I didn't know there was a specific concern or something. That's all. Is there something that you want to further discuss? Yeah, I want to research this some more. Uh, outside there of might this. be a need to include language in the way we conduct this process so that it, it's not us kind of vacillating back and forth where there, we're going to throw in a couple extra bucks or, you know, I, I think there needs to be something written in, in stone so f future boards can look at it and have something to go by as opposed to we're going to leave it up to, well, it'll come back to the board and we'll kind of do it that way. I think that's what part of his concern is. Is it the second part of the motion that's concerning? Like, could we 
separate this into two motions or you know same I just kind of want to understand like what what that's all that that's why I'm just asking, asking is it the 50 year plus 50 year rule or is it the additional up to 50 percent? right that's what well, that's my question if, all right, if, so let's, let's break it down so make sure we understand the why we want to continue it so do we want to go farther than that I don't know that I would want to just continue it just because we need to look at what we have already if you want to make an additional requirement in the motion you can do that if somebody wants to do that if you have that language ready or are all of you well I did more I don't that's why I want to put Correct. some thought to it and I would want to so ask Charlie I wouldn't want to ask the and manager how so I put a motion out how would we exactly do process uh, as opposed to if for example the, the situation we had a few minutes ago where we weren't really too sure how we were going to handle that uh, last year's budget this year's budget should it be a new uh, application or not um, I would rather see a, something some language that purely states how much when uh, if, if it should go past as we grow as a town the the 50,000 at some point might even become necessary to increase that. So we need to set balances and checks along the way that uh, let us know how much, when, and, and not even just so much us, but you know, the residents. They know that we're being good stewards with the money and we have a process. Uh, tonight, you know, it, it came up where, great, we have that problem where, you know, we have a resident that, that applied and he was warded, but now something else happened where we needed to shift a little bit. And I think that for the sake of the town, we, we should have that right now. And, and we have two by two scheduled for next week. So I think it would be very to add it into the two by two, Jeff. And, and I, th I think my reason for just for asking about the two, it, it seems like there's two separate parts to this. And I think what we're concerned about, I, I have the same concerns based on what our previous um, motion and about how we're going to handle the increases I don't I mean I would be fine voting on the 50-year rule tonight but it was the second part of the motion that I'm still having questions about and I think needs some more clarification yeah. I agree with you um, I mean but it's I don't know if anything's gonna change between now and the 27th I mean we could logically right. break them out by the 27th you know two separate motions a 50-year rule and then how the extra funding is handled I agree with that 100% but that's why I put a motion out to table this until September 27th okay. motions up any more discussion one more I just want to say I wasn't trying to be um, I, I just was trying I really want to understand your position so that's why I, I asked that question it wasn't anything more than that I want to understand the reasons why so I love it as we go forward you also pushed him <laughs> out of the helicopter too so you know. <laughs> all right motions up all in favor aye. aye all right motion carried we'll move it up you guys got a little homework to do so we can get that done yes sir you're up again I am one more thing HPC has been very busy <laughs> So the next thing that I want to discuss is the certified local government. And first I want to be very clear about what a certified local government is and what it is not. Um, a CLG is simply a municipality that has demonstrated a commitment to local preservation and that applies for designation through a certification process that is administered by the National Park Service and the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office. It is not a local historic district. An LHC is a type of zoning designation that can be applied to areas that have historic properties. It, the zoning provides controls over the appearance of the existing and proposed buildings and it is administered through a local zoning ordinance. The CLG does not establish design <coughs> standards. It is simply a designation that is um, given to us by the National Park Service. 
So some of the benefits of a CLG is funding. Um, states receive annual appropriations from the Federal Historic Preservation Fund and are required to give those funds to C CLGs in the form of grants. And these grants can fund a wide variety of projects, including architectural and archaeological surveys, national, registra national register nominations, structural assessments, physical restorations, um, preservation plans, just to name a few things. Um, CLGs also receive technical assistance from the state um, for um, the Historic Preservation Commission and building assessments and surveys. They provide training. Uh, the state and the National Park Service offer regular training opportunities for staff and HPC members and sustainability. Historic preservation has proven economic, environmental, and social benefits. Studies show that historic districts maintain higher property values, have less population decline, are more walkable, and create a greater sense of community. So the process for certification um, is an application that has many steps, and I'm not going to go into detail on all of them, but the one thing that I do want to point out is the local preservation ordinance. The Waxhaw local preservation ordinance contains the statement that no property sh shall be recommended for designation as a historic landmark unless the property owner consents. In the past, the State Preservation Office had requested that you all approve a text amendment to remove this requirement from our LDC. Uh, their reasoning was that state statute was silent on the property owner consent and that our ordinance should match the state statute. There has never been support here for that text amendment. Um, so in working with our state CLG coordinator, um, they have come back to us and told us that they will not penalize us for having that in our ordinance and that they will not block us from having our application passed along to the National Park Service. So that text amendment is no longer required. So uh, the staff and HPC recommend applying for the CLG designation and my request tonight is a motion to authorize staff to submit that application. Questions around the horn? <laughs> I have a couple just, just for the sake of conversation. So okay. this is the application that we're giving authorization for. So what happens next when it comes back approved or denied? What happens? Well, if it is approved, then we can blast that out on social media about how proud we are of our historic district and that we are now a CLG. Uh, we can apply for grants, and one of the grants that HPC would like to apply for is to redo our National Historic District Survey. Um, there are areas that probably could and should have been included. For instance, the mill should have been included in that. Um, that's probably the first thing that we'll do. And then, of course, we can open up training for people. Our HPC members, our staff members, certainly you all if you're interested in history. And you had a mention about the zoning um, part of it. How does that work into our current? We are not looking for that now. Um, we have an ordinance in place that al allows for historic landmark designation. So if there was a resident who has a historic home and wants to be designated, we have the plans in place to help them achieve that. We do not have a local historic district, so, and we are not looking for that at this time. So if we are denied, do they give you feedback and an ability to change whatever's yes left. yes actually we applied back in 2015 and it was sent back because of that text amendment um, and at that time the board decided to just table it and we are finally now in 2022 readdressing this so it's no quite controversial you guys were here. well i was just gonna say i know past boards have uh wanted not wanted this but this board has not discussed this so 
I just want to know. I mean, I would support the text amendment change, but I don't know how the other board members feel. But it, would that be up for discussion, or that's not part of the motion in question before us this evening? The motion is just to make the application, and it's not required. The you know they've come back to us and told us that we do not have to remove that language from our ordinance. When it would come back to us approved or not, we still would have to approve the next steps. Would that be correct? The next steps. Next step. So we get the approval. What happens next? That's what Yes. Well, next. yes. If we decide to apply for a grant, then yes, we would need to bring that back to you. Um, if we. So if you're looking for one more check and balance, that would probably be it. I, know, I just wish that this board could have decided first whether or not we were going to do the text amendment and then then we could have decided if we were going to apply with or without it that's all but the text, but amendment, text amendment does not affect it's irrelevant for them applying for the it is it is we just if we want to get approved it probably would have helped and that's my only question is if we were denied and then if that came back well she already she made already, that yeah. statement they have that told me that they will not penalize us not for having that in there. And actually, as we were doing the research for this um, with the CLG coordinator from the state, she sent out an email asking for feedback from other municipalities about what their ordinance says. And there is another CLG out there who has that requirement in their ordinance. So they can't penalize us for that. But Tracy, you could always revisit that in the land development code as a separate issue if the board wishes to. I guess I'm, this topic has come up in the past and we, the, the past continues to be the reason why we don't look at it ourselves and I just would have liked for this board to have looked at it, but that's did, fine. Did well, we, we discussed it during the LDC right. review, it was during one of those three-hour sessions I think where I lost my voice talking through all of it but uh, and I will actually think Madison led the, the HPC chapter but uh, that was discussed at that time and that's when at that time it was decided to keep that language in there but however can always revisit that at any time the board wishes to I'm gonna give you a microphone to carry out of water bottle. Um, so I'd like to reiterate as well for historic landmark designation, and from the office they or the state historic preservation office, they have stated that uh, they don't know of any instances where property owner consent hasn't been given. So you kind of have that security as well, to where municipalities aren't typically asking or telling someone to be designated as a historic landmark. So you have that security as well if that's a concern. It's not imposing that requirement involuntarily on the property owner. Correct. Okay, well, I'll make a motion if, as long as there's no more discussion. If there's no more discussion, you're up. Motion to authorize staff to submit an application for the town of Waxlaw to be de designated as a certified local government. All right, thank you. All right, motion is up. <laughs> now you want to do it. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I could have said all in favor. So you just you just want to hurry it up, huh? <laughs> Your foot hurts. <laughs> all right. Motions up. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thanks Thank for all you. the hard work, guys. Thank you so much. Whew. Get through another one. Okay. I think Rosie, you're up for this next one. Looks like. All right, consider approval of the budget amendments. Now he's going to throw money back into it, right? Yes. Well, so it's the end of the fiscal year for 2022, and um, I need to reallocate some funds from several departments um, to cover um, of departments that their budgets fell slightly short. Um, the main was public service, and this was due to the um, journal entry that was required by the Local Government Commission for the leases on the um, vehicles that we took 
on this year. And so in order to be in compliance with them, as we were for the previous fiscal year at a slightly later date, um, I just need to, I needed to make that journal entry and for just moving funds around a little bit. It's not shorting anyone or um, it's all good. It's, it's just an accounting it process it's with them moving, because they've tagged us for the new cars. Budgets where there was, there, all the money wasn't used by certain departments and allocating it to cover so that no one appears that their budget is over what was made. So, I mean, all in all, our, but for the budget year, we're, um, we did not spend all the funds that we allocated across the town. So we did a really good job. All right. And we've talked about this before recently on some of the two buys I know we have. So, all right. Any questions for Rosie? All right. Looking for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the amendment of the fiscal year 2022 budget to allow for the reallocation of approved departmental funds. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. We'll move down. Get off the heavy stuff. So we'll move down to the town leadership reports. Town manager Jeffrey Wells, you're up. Thank you, Mayor. Just a, a few quick things. So we had our first session of Waxall 101 last Wednesday and it was a, a wonderful session. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Had a great group there. It was a great kickoff and we've got uh, nine more weeks to go starting with um, uh, next next week and so it's a uh, it's a good group. So and I, I know that along the way some uh, board members will be there to do some introductions, so I think that you'll really enjoy yourself at whatever session you're going to be at. It's a really good group. Um, this past week, we had a, um, a guest speaker named Mr. Mitch Silver, and we had that planning event uh, over at Forest Hills Church where we uh, invited uh, a lot of our peer towns from nearby as well as the county and then other uh, key uh, individuals of interest within the um, in the area uh, it was a fantastic presentation 10 critical elements that will make tomorrow's communities I know that uh, I think most everybody in this room was uh, there and he's just an incredible speaker very inspiring uh, we will have that uh, presentation uh, available uh, very soon for uh, anybody that wishes to consume, and we'd be happy to make that uh, available through our uh, normal normal channels to anybody. And we have had uh, requests from some of the people at the meeting to uh, to get copies of the video as well as the uh, slides. So uh, I've considered it to be a big success. It's just uh, been, I think it's been really good for um, us here in Union County to hear that presentation and take some of the th things that he was saying in there to heart as we're moving forward. There was good energy in that room as well, and actually both events, the 101 as well. Yes. Let's continue on. Um, last one is just a reminder to the board that I will be at a conference the rest of the week. Lisa and I, as soon as we adjourn, will be heading to Winston-Salem. Get in early. Yeah. Safe travels. Appreciate that. All right, next up, comms team. If you're all finished there, Jeff, didn't mean to cut you off. Yes. So, Miss Jenny, come on up and join us. For those watching online, Jenny Buchholz, Town of Waxhaw Communications. Uh, quick updates tonight. Really, the biggest thing is the community-wide survey. Uh, we now have the landing page designed. The letter is all set and ready to go. I took one last peek at it last night and made a small grammatical error. I mean, a fixed a grammatical error. That is going to be mailed out the end of this week, so residents will start to receive those next week. Uh, the survey looks good. You've all reviewed it and approved it, so we've reviewed it for its final print version. We're good there. Um, we do believe by the 19th, everyone should receive those, if not a few days after. To prepare for that, we're going to have an FAQ online because we are ready for the questions that are probably going to come our way. 
Um, and so that FAQ will be up online and I'll be available to answer any questions, of course, if citizens call in. Uh, as far as stories go, the Mitch Silver article, thank you so much for providing content to that. Uh, Commissioner McMillan, that'll go in TriW tomorrow. Sounds like we want to maybe do a follow-up with the video. We can include that in happenings with a link there, and they can also download the slide deck from that digital email. And uh, we are working on the team wax hall videos. So there, those are a follow-up from your request, Mayor, to have Wax Hall 101 online. So instead of having an hour-long video segment, we're doing these short sound bites of Team Waxall that are gonna go on social media. We've shot three of them, so they're gonna be posting in September, probably later end of September. Uh, let's see, brand refresh. So you might have noticed that a lot of our social media posts include some new colors. Uh, that is from the Parks and Rec team really needing a larger palette to work with when it comes to spring and summer and 4th of July. So we needed to give them a little bit more of a playing sandbox. You know, they when you pull a bunch of colors from nowhere, they'll have that, those, that color palette to work with. So you might have seen that. We've also updated the font. Instead of using the scripted font with a veneer, which was a little bit harder to read, we've gone over to Railway, so it's just more legible. We've also starting to refresh the graphics. So you're gonna see more real imagery of Waxall instead of the illustrations, which we've kind of heard are slightly maybe sophomoric, so we're elevating the look of those. So you'll start to see that online. And last but not least, working on the Waxall Rail Safety Improvement Groundbreaking Ceremony, which I'm sure Matt Hubert might share some details. Great project as a result of a bunch of regional stakeholders working together for those railway improvements. So we've created a digital email invite that will go out similar to how we handled the planning event. And that's what we're working on. Very good, lots of work getting done. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other questions while she's still up there? Yeah, don't run away. So I won't fast. run away. <laughs> All right, you can run away. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, Ms. Dean has the night off tonight. We're going to go to Todd Matthews. Todd? I don't have a lot tonight, but uh, all the paving's done uh, for the year. We're getting ready to start up and go out and figure out where we're going next. Uh, all the speed humps are put in. They had a party on Everybody, thank y'all for that. Uh, people was actually sitting on the porch watching cars hit it and just laughing and having a good time. Uh, had to put my old man glasses on. Uh, the right of way that we gave the county on uh, Waxhaw Farms for the sewer right of way from uh, the preserves over to Joe Rogers' property, they ended up finishing that. Uh, they tore the side of the roads up pretty bad. So we talked to them about it, or I did, and uh, ended up getting the whole thing repaved. They milled the whole road and repaved it. It's about $200,000. Wow. So that was pretty good. Uh, got a leaf back and a street sweeper coming in in a couple weeks. Uh, we just ordered a thermo striping machine that we can start doing our parking lots with the thicker stuff instead of the little white paint that you can't see. So that should be here. It's coming to Sherman Williams probably next week. So we'll have that. Last thing, uh, <clears throat> I'm bringing up Sunbonnet again. Uh, that was a long job. It was fun. I'd like to thank Lisa for helping, uh, Orion for drawing up the plans, and uh, uh, Mr. Lowry and Mrs. Fletcher and Mr. Hood, Maggie Hood. James Wright, they all said they appreciate it. They can't wait for it to happen. Uh, and Mrs. Caldwell, she lives there. And I found out that I played Little League Baseball with her dad. So that was pretty cool. So, but yeah, it's, it was a lot of work, but we got it done. So that's about all I have. Uh, quite the collaborative effort. It was a yeah. very unique situation all around. So we you guys pulled it off. I felt like Andy Griffin on some of it. <laughs> helping a guy put a manifold on his truck, trying to get him to call Mrs. Hood to get a signature, and talking to Mr. Hood, trying to get his sister's number with feeding the cows and stuff, and it was pretty cool. Uh, we got her done. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any, well, before you go away, any questions, thoughts? I have, I have one. Uh, do we still have uh, the sidewalk sweeper or a – we have sweeping capability? The sidewalk sweeper is coming in with a street sweeper. And the, the old uh, one is – 
the old one is done? Oh, we still got it, but we sweep up town. But it's okay. There's like a couple of places turtle. that I want to suggest to you, so we'll talk about that offline. But yeah, yeah, there's a couple. Yeah, of we're places. trying to sweep, keep in front of Maxwell's and all swept because the roots are bad. Mm -hmm. All the junk just falls over to the side. It does. But riding it from the shop up to the uptown, it takes a while. Half of a day. Right? Yeah, it's like sitting on a turtle. Yeah. <laughs> you sit there riding. Uh, your leg about falls asleep pushing on the pedal. But, yeah, we try to do that every Friday. Okay, great. But the roads are so bad, it just, a lot of stuff bounces it off. Goes, it goes quick. You get yeah. ready real quick. We'll talk about that later right. offline. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, from the board, any thoughts, comments? Good for the group? I see, I see Commissioner Simpson. She's, I know, she's over she's, there. She's the hand's coming up. Yeah. No, I just want to reiterate, um, Mr. Mitchell Silver coming on September 8th to our town. Those of you who do know him and for those of you who don't, he is an international well-known planner, develop, uh, developer, and also someone who has led parks commissions. Um, he was very gracious in coming to our town and in working with us when the offer was extended for him to be here. And if you do get a chance or the opportunity to see his presentation or listen to it, I do hope that you do because it is filled with information that is good not only for the town of Waxhaw but also for Union County in moving forward in planning and in de development of our communities and how they should look for the population as it is changing and will be aging out in some of the years to come. So I just want to say thank you to all who participated, um, who assisted with the program itself, and um, please take the opportunity to listen to his presentation. Thank you. It was a great event. I got a lot of good feedback from it. Commissioner Simpson. I know uh, Mayor Protem is being modest, but I really would like to say kudos for helping to facilitate and organize that meeting, um, and as well as the collaborative effort with our municipal uh, partners and planners and, and being able to collaborate with everyone to be able to bring them in, and I'm looking forward to doing more events like that in the future when we get into our new town and have new town hall and have space that we can do more fun things like that. Anybody else for the good of the group? Around? Charlie? Thoughts? Good tonight. All right, you're good tonight. All right, there's uh, nothing on closed session tonight, so I'm looking for you all to race to make that motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're done. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody, for all the inputs. Good collaboration. No, Who wants good. a door <laughs> hanger? I asked for it, so I get one. You get one for sure. <laughs>